Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. And I just want to welcome everyone. You are watching Preparing a Simple Will. And this is advice on creating your own simple will with considerations for dementia. I'm Dr. Charlotte Sharfin. I'm just your host today. Uh, we've got two special people that are gonna be talking to you that I'm really grateful that they were able to join us to talk about this important topic. Um, this is put on by the Life and Death Wellness uh, nonprofit organization for which I am a founding member and really, really grateful for uh, the support that we've got locally and actually globally. Um, we're a 501c3. We were established in Hawaii and our mission is really to educate around all life matters, but especially the end because that's the part people tend to try to avoid. So um, thank you for joining. And if you're not on our mailing list, please get on it and our Facebook and our Instagram and all of those fun things. Um, the other thing I just, I didn't even realize it when we actually set this up today is World Alzheimer's Day. So how appropriate that we're actually discussing these topics today. So again, thank you for joining. Um, the two speakers today, we've got Eddie Cash Dudley, who is a family lawyer uh, here in Hawaii with lots of years of experience. And then we've also got Cole Smith, a dear friend. Uh, he's a corporate director of dementia care services at Brightview Senior living and I want them to actually take the opportunity to just introduce themselves uh, before we start the talk. So Eddie, if you want to just say just a little bit of your, um, a little bit about you. Okay, so I'm um, happy for the privilege today to share with you some information about doing a simple will. I'm a retired family law specialist from California, but I'm law here in Hawaii, I've always had a passion for end of life issues. Even as a family law attorney, I required all of my clients have a will and an advanced healthcare directive. It didn't matter to me if they were only there for child support. That was part of the criteria if they wanted to be represented by me or the other attorneys in my office. And I've had an opportunity to expand that practice here and uh, truly support the life and death wellness program and what they're doing in the community as well as um, with their outreach. Thank you. Thank you. And Cole, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am a gerontologist. I work with people living with dementia and teach people living with, sorry, teach people caring for people living with dementia how to uh, better care for them. I actually started my career as a respiratory therapist, and part of that is uh, taking people off life support at the end of life. And my first patient that I had that happened to was a 19 year old child and I was 20 at the time. And when I went through life support, his mom jumped into bed and held him like a child. And I just stood there paralyzed, couldn't offer her any support. So from that day forward, I made a vow to be uncomfortable, uh, to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And part of that is learning how to help people transition beautifully out of this life. So I've attended the end of life doula training and, and certified to do that. It's been a joy to help people realize that death can be as beautiful as birth. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. That's how I met Cole actually as a uh, respiratory therapist in Augusta, Georgia years and years ago. So thank you for being here all the way on the East Coast. Um, one other thing I do want to mention is if you have any questions, there's a Q&A box. Just as you go along, type them. There's going to be plenty of time after um, Eddie and Cole are, uh, share, share their thoughts, share their topics, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. So Eddie, it's... Uh, it's on you now, go ahead. Thank you. I did wanna mention that I'm fortunate to live in Kohala on the north side of, northwest side of the big island of Hawaii, not very far from where the Life and Death Wellness Center is located. So one of the things that has always amazed me is that why people don't have a will. So when I've asked people, well, why don't you have a will? It's almost like, well, if I have a will, that means I'm gonna die. Yeah, but, <laughs> You're going to die anyway, so why don't you have a will? And a lot of times, um, people are afraid to go on attorney, to an attorney. Uh, attorneys sometimes will say something is going to cost one thing, and then at the end of the day, it costs a lot more. So they're really concerned about, are they going to get ripped off? Uh, is this something that they can do on their own? And because of a very profound belief that everybody needs a will, what we're going to do today 
is to show you how to do your own so you don't have to have an attorney help you. The will that you're going to prepare is legal in any state where you live. And you can print it of uh, the computer. Dr. Sharpen's going to give you a link so that you can get this document itself. It's a one page document. And you can also sign it, have it witnessed, and it's a legal will. There's another type of will we'll be talking about in a minute. But first of all, what do you need to do to have a will? Well, you have to be over 18 years old and you should write a will according to your state of residency. So for example, my will says, I, Edna Fay, yeah, I'm from the South, Cash Dudley, a resident of the state of Hawaii. And I'm, of course, I'm over 18 years old. <clears throat> the capacity issue is going to be a little bit uh, better discussion later with Cole talking about capacity to make a will, but I would say that the testamentary capacity standard is very low, that the person just has to know what you have and what do you want to have happen to it. So it's important to have a general idea about what you want to have happen to your estate. For example, if you have children, you may want things to go to your children. Uh, if you have assets, you'll have certain assets you may want to go to particular individuals. The will that I have created as the model also have, has the um, disinheritance section. So for example, if you had a child who was on drugs, you may not want that child to get those assets um, at your death you may want to give those assets to that child and trust until that child can show that they're no longer on drugs. For example, if you had a child who was, um, had a felony conviction and had a restitution order, the minute that child inherited from you, uh, the state could grab the money to pay off a restitution order. So you do have the ability to give and you have the ability to take away. So it's all up to you. Rather than leave it up to the state on who gets your assets, it's up to you to decide what happens to your assets. And then you need to name somebody called your personal representative in Hawaii. In California, it's called an executor. I practiced law for over 30 years in the state of California. But it's the person who's going to make it happen. Whatever you have in your will, the executor, your personal representative, is the person who is going to make it happen. All wills have to be uh, signed in the presence of two witnesses, save and accept a holographic will, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So once you decide what you wanna have happen to your estate, it's important in your will to say who is to get that asset. I remember in law school, when we were doing trusts and estates, this guy wrote a will and he said, you know, my name is such and such, I'm of a sound mind, I'm a resident of the state of New York. I just want my children to know how much I love them. And my personal executor is, and then he named a personal executor. Well, what did he not do? He didn't say who got everything. So who got everything? Well, it goes according to intestate succession. And intestate succession is very similar to the laws on next of kin, which we talked a little bit about in the Advanced Healthcare Directive Seminar that we went to. Who is your next of kin? And typically that would be your spouse. If you don't have a spouse, it would be your children. If you don't have children, it would be your parents. If you don't have spouse, children, parents, it would go to your siblings. And if your siblings are deceased, it might go to your nieces or your nephews. And if that isn't the way that you want to have your estate divided when you pass, then it's important for you to have a will signed in the presence of two witnesses. I always recommend people say out loud, I declare this to be my last will and testament. They don't have to see it. They don't have to know what you're doing with your property. They don't have to see your list of assets. They just have to know that you've signed it and that you're over 18 and they also have to be over 18. The second type of will you can do is called the holographic will. This is a very um, seldom used opportunity to state what you want, but it is legal in all 50 states. It has to be written by hand by you. 
So you could have something typed up. Theoretically, you could use the model that we're providing um, on Dr. Sharpen's website, as well as on my website, which is efcashdudleylaw.com, print it out. As long as the material facts are written by hand by you, it's considered a holographic will. And you should say that you're of a sound mind and that you're a resident of the state of, whichever state you're a resident of, and list your assets. And you don't have to list everything individually. You can just say, I own a home or my real property. You might have something that you want to go to a specific person. For example, I have a Rolex watch. I want that to go to my granddaughter who is named after me. So that's in my will. Um, and then name a personal executor or a personal representative or an executor. The difference between a holographic will and other types of wills is it doesn't have to be witnessed. You can write it on a napkin. They've been written on all types of surfaces. As long as you follow the rules about what makes it a holographic will, it's written by your hand. It's written with your name and your state of residency. You've listed your assets and you've listed who you want those assets to go to. And then you've named an executor or a personal representative. So if you really have a lot of concerns about going to a lawyer, about spending a lot of money to have this estate planning device created for you, do it yourself. I always recommend that people give a copy of their will to the people who are going to benefit from the will. So a copy of a will is as good as the original if the original can't be found. So if you have three favorite nieces and you're giving them each something in your will, those three favorite nieces should get a copy of your will. Just in case the fourth niece who didn't get anything finds the will first and destroys it. So anyway, that's a very simple approach to one of the end of life training tools that we're making available for people uh, through these webinars. So if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the Q&A box and we'll be glad to answer those at the end of the seminar. Thank you. Is it my go? Yeah, Cole, why don't you oh, go perfect. ahead and take over? Um, I'd like to talk with you all about how do we figure out what our loved one's wishes are if they did not write them down, either in a will or an advanced directive. Um, and they have, are living with dementia. Um, the shortest, most simple answer is to just ask. If they are living in the early stage of Alzheimer's or uh, the early part of their diagnosis of any kind of dementia, ask them. What that's going to do is alleviate you or your family members doing things out of guilt, doing things like a feeding tube because you don't know if that's what your, your loved one would want. Um, but you don't want to just come out and ask abruptly. You want to set the stage for that. Set up a nice dinner. Make it a nice, quiet, intimate time that you can reminisce and really talk about life and what a wonderful life they've lived and um, all the beautiful memories you have with them. Then you can start asking things. Well, if something does happen to you, what would you want? <clears throat> Make sure you write those things down. Um, you want to ask... Uh, to me, the number one question I start out with, and I just did this with my grandmother a few months ago, is um, are you satisfied with the life you lived? Uh, because people carry around a lot of guilt, a lot of trauma, a lot of past with them. And if they are carrying that stuff and they have not uh, worked through it, you might not get those honest answers about what they want at the end of life, or you may see a struggle at the end of life. So. Um, with my grandmother, uh, I have good granny and bad granny, and this was bad granny, and they earned their names. Uh, <laughs> and I love bad granny, uh, she just passed away, uh, but she was a tough cookie her whole life. So when she got a terminal diagnosis, uh, first thing, and she also had early stage Alzheimer's, uh, the first question I asked her was, are you satisfied with the life you lived? And she took a big breath and um, she said, yeah, I am. I said, are there people you might want to make amends with? And she said, yeah, there are. <laughs> so uh, we got on the phone and we started writing letters and we got in touch with people that she needed to make amends with. 
And what that did was clear her mind, clear her heart to be able to express to us what her final wishes were. Um, sorry, uh, let's see. Uh, but when you're uh, caring for someone that is mid to late stage uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, further into their diagnosis and their answers may not be as reliable. What you can do is the same thing. You can ask, you can set the stage and reminisce, but what I would do is invite the people that are important to that person to sit down and share a meal, share a cup of coffee, and talk about what their life was, the parts that you enjoyed, the parts that you knew they enjoyed, their love of travel, their love of food, um, and then you can start gaining an understanding of what your loved one truly would want. And you have a collective body helping you so that you're not burdened with making decisions by yourself. I have a good friend named Katie, and we were talking about how her mom passed away. Uh, she had Alzheimer's. And when her and her sisters uh, were sitting down and really looking at their mom's life, she loved to travel, but she traveled for the culinary experiences. She wanted to taste the world. So when they were looking at the advanced directive and considering tube feeding, well, absolutely not. That's taking away the joy that their mom enjoyed, or their mom loved most, which was tasting the world, tasting foods. That was her way of sharing love. So they decided against it. And they were able to come to that decision together all by reminiscing and really figuring out what their mom truly loved in life. Um, another thing is if you have siblings or loved ones that maybe there's some turmoil or unresolved issues, I recommend reading the book, uh, The Four Things That Matter Most by Dr. Ira Bayek. He's a hospice physician and he talks about the emotional needs of those that are at end of life. And they need to hear these four things, and I'm not going to spoil them for you, uh, but you can have that conversation at any time. It doesn't have to be at end of life. You can have it uh, tomorrow, or when you sit down to do the figuring out of what your loved one would like, you could go ahead and have this conversation too, and it'll make the decision making a lot easier. Um, once we figure all that out uh, and we're looking at how do we honor our loved one after they pass? How do we do a celebration of life that truly reflects them? That's when you start looking at everything throughout their life that they loved. Smells, have candles that are lavender or baby powder or look at lotions and things that they really enjoyed, foods. If you're throwing a celebration of life, why not have all of their favorite foods, even if they don't necessarily go together? It's all right. Uh, they may be a hodgepodge, aren't we all? When you look at music, uh, look at their life and look at what music they loved from the time they were 16 to 26. We uh, connect closely or most closely to music between those years because that's when all of our major life events happen getting married, having children, graduating high school. Um, and you can really start figuring out what music they may enjoy at their celebration of life. And that concludes my little piece. Awesome. Thank you, Cole. And, um, and thank you, Eddie, for, for sharing your experiences and your knowledge. And it looks like we do have a few questions um, coming through. So let's, uh, let's start with competency. This is a good question. It says, um, in the early stages of dementia, can you still write a will? I guess that would be a good one for you, Eddie. So the level of testamentary capacity is extremely low. Basically, the person has to know the extent of what they have and they have to know to whom they want their assets to be um, given to at their death. It's a little more difficult when they are in the further stages along of Alzheimer's or dementia because many times they can't remember what they have. One of the things that uh, is 
one of the cases that Dr. Sharfin and I are working on quite recently is we do have a client, a common client, who has early stage dementia. And both of us recognize that she has early stage dementia. However, both of the psychiatrist and the attorney that she was examined by said she has testamentary capacity. So as long as the person knows what they have and they know to whom it should be awarded, they have testamentary capacity. They can write a will. And that's, okay. I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Cole. I just wanted to add, when you are talking with your loved one uh, living with dementia, early, not early mornings, early for them, whenever they wake up is their best time of day typically because they start out with a full tank of gas and as they go through their day, their capacity diminishes. So if you want to have these important conversations, make that appointment with your attorney early in the day so that you get the best version of your loved one. Good idea. Yeah, that's actually a really, that's a really good point. And I think that kind of, um, uh, we'll keep going with this, this kind of questions. Um, who determines the, the, the competency or the capacity? So would it be the lawyer or who, who how, how does that work, Eddie? Well, I think I have a duty as an attorney to certainly not write a will for somebody that's incapacitated. So I have to make an initial first evaluation as to whether or not this person is incapacitated or whether or not they have testamentary capacity. I might do that by having a conversation about what they have and how did they get it and how long have they lived in the house and what did they do for a living. Um, in a case where just a couple months ago, I was asked to write a bill for a person that I suspected had early stages of dementia. I contacted a local attorney who had training, had gone to seminars in testamentary capacity determination. And I said, hey, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. I think she's got testamentary capacity but I wanna make sure that we're not doing something that would be inappropriate. Would you personally do an evaluation of her regarding her capacity? And so my friend called this potential client, went through the questions that she had learned at the seminar to ask and uh, wrote me back an email and said, she has testamentary capacity. So I was able to write the will. In a situation where there's a bigger question about whether or not they have testamentary capacity other than something that's easily visible where maybe there's just one red flag, but in the case where it's more serious, it's not uncommon to have a psychiatric evaluation done of the client. And the psychiatric evaluation done by a psychiatrist usually includes a lot more than testamentary capacity. It can include recommendations for conservatorship, guardianships, and things like that. But one of the things that we'll touch on is whether or not that person has testamentary capacity. So on the low level, start with the attorney. If the attorney has a question, maybe go up the scale a little bit, have somebody who has a little bit of training and asking the questions and reaching a determination. And then the end result would be, if you really still have a lot of questions, um, ask if your potential client or that person would be willing to go through a psychiatric examination so that their will would not be challenged in the end. So that's the level that I would be looking at. Great. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Cole, as far as just in your capacity of working with um, different stages of dementia and if there's any kind of, um, you know, family disagreements around uh, what what they think the, the 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 client would really want if you've got any tricks or tools um, that you've used for your own um, either family or clients so I always try to get families involved in support groups and uncomfortable conversations early so that we can work through any situations where there's a child that feels slighted or a sibling that doesn't get along with another one. I always ask that I meet with siblings. I don't want your spouses. Um, I'm sure they're lovely people, but they complicate things. And um, so yeah, having those honest conversations and also realizing that sometimes when people act irrational, not the person living with dementia, I'm talking their families, they're grieving. Every stage of dementia is a loss 
if you look at it that way. It's truly, there's also a beautiful way to look at it too, but that's another talk. Um, but the families grieve every single step that they lose something. It's one more slap in the face that they don't have their mom or their dad in the capacity that they used to. So getting them the counseling, the support, support groups um, that they need so that when you are looking at um, what mom or dad would want, all of that is cleared up. Great, thank you, thank you. Let's see, um, what else? Oh, okay, as far as the handwritten wills, Eddie, um, are there, uh, like who actually should write these? Is there somebody that, is it there like a group that fits into, okay, this would be a great thing for you to write or are certain people that don't? And I think that really pertains to like assets. So if you could just maybe speak a little bit about that. Well, the handwritten will is written in your own hand. It can't be written by somebody else and you sign off on it. It has to be physically written by you and it has to identify who you are and identify your assets. And as I said earlier, it doesn't have to be a detailed list of how many glasses you have in the cabinet, your set of dishes. <laughs> it can just be basically, I own real property and I have furniture, cars and bank accounts and I want those assets to go to and then name the person that those assets are to go to. If there's another logical heir, for example, if your only relatives are two living nieces and one of them you don't like, it would be smart in your holographic will to say, I don't want niece B to inherit from me because if everything goes to niece A, then niece B is going to be saying, well, geez, I should have been able to get some of that because you know she's my living relative too. Mm -hmm. So the holographic will, um, it doesn't mean holographic in the traditional sense of watching something on television. It just means it's in your own handwriting. Right, yeah. And I think too, what uh, this person was trying to ask, maybe if I'm reading it correctly, is like, let's say you have a lot of assets is it still okay to use this handwritten will or the holographic will for that or? Now, as an attorney, if you have a lot of assets, I would advise that you may wanna do a consultation with an attorney about setting things up in a trust. Because one thing that I didn't mention, um, not really thinking about it being part of the seminar, is that if you have a will and you have real property, it goes through probate. And the state takes a dollar and the executor takes a dollar and the taxes take a dollar. so. Um, the end result may not be exactly what you had in mind when you wrote the will. So if you do have a lot of assets, you may want to consider doing a consultation with an attorney to see whether or not a trust would be appropriate. But assuming that you don't care, I had a lady who was a millionaire and I said, well, you know, you really should set up a trust. And she said, I don't care what's left when I die. I don't want to do that. I just wanted to go to, and she named her favorite charity. So it doesn't matter how large your estate is on whether or not you have a simple will or whether you, have, whether you have a holographic will, the only consequence that's going to be of importance to you, maybe and maybe not, is that if it's just a will, it'll go through probate. If it's a trust, it avoids probate. So there's a little bit more money at the end if it's in a trust rather than if it's in a will. And probate, of course, is public. So if you write a will and it goes to probate, that's public information. Anybody off the street can come in and see everything that is now in your estate. Because even if your will just says, I leave all my property to my favorite niece A, uh, all of that property is going to be listed and valued in your probate. So probates are public. So that's another reason to consider having a consultation for a trust. They usually run a couple thousand dollars. Uh, I know some attorneys, especially on this island, charge a lot more than that. So if you have a large estate, you may want to consider doing a trust consultation. That's actually really great information. It sounds like even another webinar we could do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah totally. Um, let's see. How, let's see, what's... Okay, so the handwritten wills, are, can they easily be challenged? Let's say niece B is really upset that she did not get any of your assets. Are, is, it is it easy or difficult to challenge those after you've died, I guess is the question. Well, first of all, a will doesn't speak until somebody dies. That's 
And so they're called ambulatory. They can get up and walk around and you can change them and you can revoke them and you can modify them and you can add codicils. And so the will itself doesn't speak until you die. There's always an ability to file a lawsuit. I mean, I'm an attorney, right? Anybody can file a lawsuit. And one of the most common lawsuits that's filed in probate court is somebody who felt like they should have gotten something and they didn't. And the most common complaint around that issue is undue influence. And sometimes there is undue influence. There was a case that I was talking with um, during the end of life doula training about a, an end of life doula who moved into a home with a person who was uh, living their end of life. And the person decided that they really wanted to give that home to the end of life doula. Well, was that undue influence? It might have been. My experience is that it's not always undue influence. Sometimes it's just elderly people who are by themselves wanting to secure their place in, in the relationship so that they know that somebody's going to be there to take care of them at the end. I recall when my grandmother uh, was very, very ill at her end of life, she called in my uncle, who was the oldest son, and said, um, I want you and your wife to move in with me and I want you to take care of me. I'm going to need care here in my home and I'm going to give you my home. Now that was my granny's desire that whoever would move in and take care of her would have her home. So that's what she did. My uncle and his wife sold their property. They moved in with granny. They took care of her for a while. She died. He inherited the house. She had already put him on the deed. But guess what? She didn't tell anybody. The other six kids didn't find out about it till she died. Was that undue influence? Absolutely not. That was a person stating her desires and making it happen. But in other circumstances, especially, and I think Cole could address this, when you get into these advanced stages of dementia, where the emotions uh, can be so rampant that a person could very well change their entire estate plan just because they want to secure care, they want to secure what they believe is the love of somebody that's maybe taking care of them. So can wills be challenged? Always. Uh, undue influence is probably the only major cause of a lawsuit uh, when it comes to a will. You can't challenge a will just because you didn't get what you wanted. You can't challenge a will just because mama had a favorite, <laughs> which we do. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that was, uh, that was a really, uh, well, yes. Did you have anything to add, Cole, around that? Anything you've seen as far as? Um... Truthfully, what I would recommend is um, at the time of the will being written to have a mini mental status exam of some type done because it goes beyond showing um, the capacity. What was the type of capacity? I'm sorry, Eddie. Testamentary. Testamentary that's capacity. That's really, Capacity to write a will is called testamentary capacity. Thank you. So yes, um, that would actually show what stage of dementia they're actually living in. And it would show that there potentially would not be that undue influence because they could make decisions themselves. Um, it would be a little more, um, as Eddie and I were talking prior, uh, it would be a little more substantial than just, uh, I can list that I have a house and I want my son to get it. Another thing that I wanted to add too, um, which a friend of mine did, she had a woman who was totally uh, bright, knew what she wanted. And she came in and she said, I want to change my will because my youngest daughter is just out of college and doesn't have a house. And my oldest daughter already has a house. So I want to change my will to give my house to my youngest daughter. Substantial value in that house. So my friend, who's an attorney and was an estate planning attorney in California and is working with me over here, she said, hold on just a second. So she called in her secretary and got the video camera. Ah. And she said, now I'm going to do what we call voir dire, which is ask questions. I'm going to ask you questions about capacity and why you're doing what you're doing. And asked the questions, very comfortable with the outcome, redid the will. Six months later, the daughter who wasn't listed in the will comes in with mom saying, my mom's here to change your will. 
and she de she didn't want to do that in the first place and she wants to change it and so my friend was able to play the video back to the daughter who had been theoretically disinherited and refused to change the will because at that point she felt like there was undue influence and undue pressure in the opposite direction so that's actually, that brings up a really good point. I'm glad you said that about video because that was actually a question I just popped into my head. So it's, is it a good idea to have yourself videoed? Let's say, you know, just could I video myself and say, I want to leave all of these things in addition to writing the will and not have dementia, not have any issues, but would that help? Would that help me to do that? It would help anybody who would challenge your capacity to write that will. So one of the things that I've always had to be concerned about in dealing with people with low level dementia is at what point will the videotape that I've made or the recording that I've made actually be used against them? Because maybe it was in the afternoon and they were a little bit more confused right then. And it was a little bit different than what we had talked about maybe the morning before on what they wanted to do. So if there's no question that you have the capacity to do it, you know, do a, a love letter legacy on tape if you want to. But if you're really thinking about the legal implications of what could happen to a will, if it was evident that the person was suffering from low level dementia, even if it was low level dementia, then that would be a will that could be easily challenged. Yeah. If they didn't have the capacity to write it. Sure. Yeah. And I like, I mean, I, when I teach about advanced directives, that's one thing um, I like to encourage people to do is actually get on a video and say what your wishes are. I think that makes it so much more powerful when you can actually look at the person, you see that they were speaking from their heart and this is what they wanted. So Right, good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we are probably only, I think I only see one more question for, um, unless there's more questions, please type them in. But, uh, and you may have mentioned this, but it's another question. What happens to your property when you do not have a will? Well, each and every state is different about what happens to your property. Hawaii has, in my opinion, one of the most unusual intestate succession laws that I've ever read. Um, Theoretically, in most states, and I'll give you California as an example because I practiced there for 30 years. If you are married, your estate goes to your spouse. Even if you're not legally divorced, but not living together. That's why it's important to have a will. Because if your spouse has lived in New York for 25 years, but it's still your spouse, then when you die, your estate goes to your spouse. If you lived in California, almost the same as if you lived in Hawaii. If you don't have a spouse, and, and uh, it doesn't matter if, if you think you have a spouse, but they're not legally your spouse. Hawaii and most states, except down in the South, just a few states in the South have common law marriage. So you could live with somebody for 25 years and they would never inherit from you because they're not your legal heir. And same thing with children. After spouse, it goes to children. Maybe you have in Hawaii what we call a Hanai daughter or a son. Maybe you have somebody that you're very close to. Sometimes um, you might be closer to a, a person who's not your legal child than you are to your actual children, but they will not be able to inherit from you unless they're your legal heirs or they're listed in your will. So if you wanted to disinherit a, a child, but leave something to a, a person who is not your legal heir, you could do that in a will. And then it goes back up to your parents. And if your parents are gone, then it goes out to your siblings. Maybe you have a brother that you wouldn't you know, give the time of day to, but if you don't write a will and that order of succession goes down, people that you would have no intention of ever having your property would be able to get your property. So every state is different. If you wanna know, just Google it. What happens to my property if I die without a will? And you can find out what that particular state has. And like I said, Hawaii is unusual. There's only one point in Hawaii where the spouse gets everything. And that's if she's been married to her husband and all of their kids are his. So if she had a child or he had a child, none of that marriage, that skews the estate. So it's really important to write down exactly what you want to have happen to your property, especially if there's 
people that you really wouldn't like to have things that you worked really, really hard in your lifetime to accumulate so that it could go down to your posterity. And okay, actually, we have another question that just came up, um, which goes along with actually what you're just talking about. So this person asks, any advice for getting someone to actually prepare a will that's really not interested in doing it? Um, this person concerned that because by, by the time their loved one passes, they're going to be deal, dealing with the, this mess. <laughs> so any advice from either one of you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we're making it so simple. <laughs> we're, we're practically doing it for you <laughs> with this seminar and with this model that I'm giving you. You can take this model that I gave you and it's on Dr. Uh, Sharpen's website, print it out, hand write it in, sign it, get it witnessed, or just take it and hand write it yourself. How, how much, how simple could that be? So I think the thing that we have to deal with is the fear that's around, oh, I will, I'm going to die. Those two aren't connected. You know, most people who fly in airplanes eat potatoes, but you're not going to stop eating potatoes because an airplane crashes, right? So just writing a will doesn't hasten your death. <laughs> right. And I think that's what the person's asking is, is how do you get somebody that kind of probably has a fear around it, whatever that is. How, is there any advice you can give to kind of help encourage them to do a will? And I think probably the same thing applies to an advanced directive. You know, we talk to people till we're blue in the face about the importance of really doing this as a gift, as a gift to their loved ones. Um, that's what I was going to say. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Cole. I was just going to say setting that stage and making a nice meal, their favorite meal, and having it be a time of, I know you love me and you would not want to leave me with not knowing what to do. Let them know that they're actually relieving you of a burden because you're going to be able to properly provide what they want. That'd be the only thing I would add. Yeah, that's one of the things that uh, we've talked about in the Advanced Healthcare Directive, and it's very true of the will. You're not really doing it for yourself. You're doing it for your loved ones. You're doing it so that their level of anxiety, their level of frustration, um, the conflict, we've seen so much conflict where people have gotten ill without an Advanced Healthcare Directive, or they've died without a will, and then everything is just up for grabs. So you're really not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for your loved ones. The greatest compassion you can have for your loved ones is to make sure that they know at your end of life what you wanted to have happen with your life. That is your highest level of compassion, not for yourself. And don't be stubborn about it. It takes a minute. We've made it so easy. It takes a minute. <laughs> yeah. and you, only have to, you only have to do it once. <laughs> And there's some great resources out there too um, that are listed. You probably have them on your site. I have them on mine. The Conversation Project, which I know you've used, um, Eddie. Uh, I think of Compassion and Choices. They are another really, they're a nonprofit with a lot of great resources that help someone decide what is important to them and, and just little, little by little, little by little, getting people to open up to this. Um, um, yeah, so, and uh it looks like that's it. I don't see any more questions coming through. I don't know if you guys have any more, any more comments you want to add before we start to wrap this up. Well, I just want to say thank you again, Dr. Sharpen, for making these types of webinars available to the community and to other people around the world and around the globe and around, certainly around the United States. And I really appreciate the opportunities to support the life and death wellness and appreciate the the topicality of what we're doing, you know, these things are happening today. This isn't something that's in the future. This is what's happening today. People are getting dementia today. They're getting Alzheimer's today. They're dying today. And if there's anything we can do to serve with our heart of service to this community, you've given us that opportunity and we certainly appreciate it. Oh my God. Thank you. That makes me want to cry. <laughs> I appreciate this. This is, this is, this brings me so much joy. And, uh, you know, I know it's, it's hard during a pandemic. We feel so disconnected in so many different ways. Um, and this to me though, is a really wonderful way to be able to actually come together globally and address these issues. And, um, so thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for, for being a part of this. Thank you, Cole, 
my God, it's amazing to see you all the way uh, across, you know, on the East Coast. Um, and uh, a couple of things I do want to mention, and then I think you've got one more slide, Eddie, but um, please don't forget to join the mailing list. Um, that is uh, really important. It helps us really get our word out and let other people know about our nonprofits. Um, we are a total little grassroots nonprofit and we want to be able to do more education. We want to make it bigger. We want to create a palliative care program for our island in a way that's never been done before. I actually just came across an ambulance today, guys. It's for sale on the island. Um, I've always wanted to be able to transport patients at the end of their life to go do kind of some of the wishes that they have, that they still haven't accomplished, see things that they've never seen. I'm working with a gentleman right now who has never been to Waipio Valley. Um, and I'd love to be able to take him there. So just a few of the kind of ideas we've got on our plate. We do have another webinar coming up. It's scheduled for October 1st. And um, this one, please sign up for this. Um, this is Dr. Scott Shannon. He is a holistic psychiatrist based out of Colorado, um, and he's going to be talking about psychedelics, how they pertain to mental health, and how they pertain to end of life. This gentleman, um, he's world renowned. I mean, he's really probably got most of the latest up to date research and the experience. So that will be October 1st at 1230 uh, Hawaii time. And um, I think that's it. I think those are all of my announcements. I do want to share your last screen that you wanted to talk about, I believe. Um, I did want to mention um, this last slide that I put together to just give you an idea of typically what I would personally charge to do an advanced health care directive, the durable financial power of attorney, which um, Dr. Sharfin and I are going to be putting together a further seminar on the durable financial power of attorney and how that impacts your end of life decisions. Also the last will and testament. And what I'm willing to do, and I'll make myself available maybe one day a month to come up here to the life and death wellness or on email if you'd like, if you would like to have the advanced healthcare directive prepared by an attorney, the durable financial power of attorney prepared by an attorney or the last will and testament prepared by the attorney for a contribution, a donation to the Life and Death Wellness Center of the amount that I would normally charge to do that, I will be glad to do that for you. And we do free consultations on trust. If you uh, had a question about the size of your estate and whether or not you should consider having a trust, we do um, free consultations on that as well. So anyway, thank you so much again and take advantage of all these benefits and these offers. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. That's so generous. So generous. Thank you both. Oh, bless you both. And uh, yeah, good to see you. Good to catch up and chat. Yes. All right. You. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>